Hey guys, I hope that you're doing well and that you're staying safe and healthy. I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to meet with you guys on Sundays or Saturdays as we start opening things back up. It might take a bit of time, but I'm hopeful that we might be able to have the opportunity to meet again soon face to face. But until then, I wanted to continue to do these videos and reach out to you guys through texts and phone calls, Facebook, whatever it needs to be. If you have prayer requests, we would love to be praying for the specific needs that you have. We're praying for you guys each week, and I hope that uh, you're doing well and that you'll consider uh, letting us in on any way we can pray. Put it in the comments in the video or text us, call us, whatever you need to do. And uh, please pray for me and my family. My grandmother did pass away from COVID-19 a few days ago, and um, that's tough for my family, but we are thankful that she's no longer in pain. We're glad that she was a believer and that she's in heaven with the Lord now. And so we're thankful for that. And it's still going to be a tough situation, though. My uh, dad has a lot to figure out on how we are going to be able to do the funeral and different things. So please be praying for me and my father and my family. But uh, let's go ahead and jump into the lesson this morning after we pray. God, we just thank you for today. We thank you that we are able to use technology to continue to meet in this way, that we can read your scripture together and continue to grow more deeply in our relationship with you and the way that we read scripture together. So I pray that as we read your word today, that you will um, give us special insight into what it is that you want us to know. Pray this in your name. Amen. So this series has been really cool to get to see the truth behind a lot of verses that may be commonplace to us, but now we can know more deeply what they actually mean and how the writers and the Holy Spirit meant for us to read them today. The Verses that we've gone through so far is Philippians 4.13 and Jeremiah 29.11. Some pretty common verses that you can find, of course, in churches, but also on t-shirts, cards, signs, everything that you can think of decoration-wise that people put up in their houses or wear on their shirts or socks, whatever it is. And... That's why it's so important that we understand scripture, because as Christians, we want people to know that we trust God and we trust his word. But when we have things plastered on our wall, right, that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, both of those verses. But we actually don't know where they come from. That's a problem. When people come into your house and they see that, they say, oh, okay. You know, they think, okay, you're a Christian. Okay, you like that verse. But how much more does it mean, especially to God, that you read the scriptures that you plaster everywhere and that you actually know what they mean and how he intended it to be read? And so that's why this is so important. I hope that you'll consider reading scripture in the way that we have been going through it, right? The them, the original audience, God, what does the passage teach us about God? And then us, what does the verse mean to us? Because when we read the Bible, just looking for how we can apply it, that leads to a lot of problems because scripture wasn't necessarily written directly for us to apply. That's why it's important for us to break it down in this way. So this week's passage is Matthew 18, 20, which is a very common verse, especially read in the church. It might not be on any shirts or cards, but it's a verse that is pretty commonly used in the church. So let's check it out. It says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now Matthew 
18 and 20, Jesus is speaking. He's the main character of Matthew of the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament. And so Jesus is the one speaking here to a audience that is primarily Jewish and primarily the disciples, right? His 12 disciples who are following along with him. He also had other followers who would be listen, listening to him and following along. But this verse specifically comes in a section of scripture where we can look right back to the heading. This verse starts with the word for. And we know from the past verses that we've read that verses that start with for often get taken out of context because we overlook the verses that come before it. But the word for means what I'm saying is because of everything I just said. So it's important that we know what came before it. So let's look at what came before it, starting in verse 15. If we read Matthew 18, 15, if you look at that heading in your Bible, if your Bible is like mine, it says, if your brother sins against you. So we have a little bit of a... Um, insight into that truth of what the context is already. So let's go ahead and read from 15 to 20. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge made may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the true that tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So, speaking of context, just immediately, what is this passage about? The main idea, the main point that Jesus is trying to get across is the fact that this is what to do when... <laughs> Your brother sins against you, right? When somebody offends you in some way, does something wrong and causes you pain, grief, sorrow, whatever it may be, this is what you do. And he describes you go to them immediately. Just you two talking. You don't go and tell your friend and gossip about what they did to you that hurt your feelings, you immediately go to that person and you say, hey, this is what happened. This is how I felt. This is how I think that it is wrong. Can we work this out? And then if it all works out, great. You didn't have to drag anybody else into it. You two worked it out amongst, your, amongst yourself. But if it doesn't work out, then you go talk to some other people within the church right? Some other believers, because they have a mind like the other brothers in the church, right? They are able to know what scripture says, know right from wrong. And so then you, two or three, go and you say, hey, we heard that this is what happened. We really think that you should turn from what you did and do the right thing. And then Hopefully that works out, but if not, then it comes before the church. It just grows from that. It just grows from that. The fact that you get bigger and bigger, but if they still don't repent by then, their heart is so hardened that Jesus is saying, basically treat them like somebody who doesn't believe because they obviously don't understand that what God has put on these people's hearts as this is a sin, this is something wrong, it's not affecting them. And that's a problem. 
And so he's saying, you know, treat them like unbelievers, somebody who needs to know the truth in the gospel, not somebody who we shun, but somebody who we reach out to with the truth. And so let's break it down now. Let's go into the them, God, us. Very important thing. So them, who is the speaker and who is the audience? God, as Jesus, right? Jesus is the one speaking to the people following him, his disciples and those following them at the time. He's saying, when somebody sins against you, this is what you do to those people. So Jesus has not died yet. He is on the earth talking to Jewish people. Matthew, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, in particular was written for a Jewish audience. So that also adds to the fact that Matthew, recalling what Jesus did in his time as a disciple, he's recalling it and telling it to Jewish people who will be reading it for years to come. That was his intended audience. So that's important to know because they knew about a Messiah coming and Matthew's goal was to tell them that Jesus was this Messiah that they were looking for. So that's important. And then we also know that these are followers of Jesus before he died. So that is important for the difference between us and them that we'll get to later. But what does this teach us about God? Now, let's break it down to what it says about God. God has a desire for us as followers of him to solve our problems amongst ourselves. We need to ask each other for help, but rely on him to provide the information on how to sort out our issues. And he supplies us with wisdom and strength, especially when we have multiple people, right? He says, don't just go on your own, then get it validated by other people. You will know that you are more correct if more Christian believers agree that the thing, the problem amongst you two is real. If you say, this is exactly what happened. And they say, you know, according to scripture and what God's put on my heart, that's definitely wrong. Let's go talk to them so that we can get it sorted out because we want to have unity in the body of Christ. We don't want to build up walls of anger between ourselves. All right. So then what's the difference between us and the followers of Jesus then? They had Jesus with them there. We have God's word, but Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. And we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Now, the Holy Spirit did come on some of the believers to help them do miracles and things at the time. But they did not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them until after Jesus died. And there was Pentecost in Acts. And so that is something that we have now as believers. We all have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so that's a pretty cool difference because we know from scripture that the Holy Spirit gives us discernment and helps us understand what God's word says and to basically tell right from wrong. So a very important aspect, especially when dealing with conflict between two people. What else is different? Not really you know, a whole lot besides that. So we can begin to work on our application there of this passage. I think that we can probably all agree that the beginning of the scripture can be pretty well translated or brought into our lives to apply the same way. When we have a problem with somebody else, we need to go to them first. We don't need to start gossip. We don't need to complain about it to a friend or even our parents when the problem is just between us two and all you need to do is say, hey, this is what happened rather than 
bringing more emotion into it because you're telling, oh, mom and dad, or oh, best friend, guess what this person did to me? They're so mean, right? And then that's just fueled by what? By anger, by protection. You know, you bring people in who want to help protect you because they love you and they care about you. But instead, you go to this person, first of all, and you just say, hey, what you did, it really hurt my feelings. And I was hoping that you know, we could work it out. And hopefully that person will change. But if not, bringing more people in after you've talked to them, you say, hey, I talked to this person about what happened and you explain the story and they say okay you know let's pray about it. let's think about it let's get you know let's not make a emotional decision but let's ask the holy spirit what to do we have the holy spirit living inside of us so we make those decisions and so we can apply the rest of that the same way we treat conflict the same way that jesus described it bring it before the church as a, you know, last resort, when things aren't working out, then we treat them like somebody who just doesn't understand the gospel. But then what does our verse mean? Our last verse, verse 20, what does it say? For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Well, this verse is talking about people gathering together to gain insight from God, from the Holy Spirit, about how to handle conflict. This verse is about us asking and saying, God, how do we solve this problem between these two people? And God giving insight, right? He is among them in their decision making because they are gathered in his name asking him for guidance to lead them on how to handle this problem. Now, this is kind of difficult, right? Because how are we saying it before? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. When we pray and we bring it before the church. Well, in church, when we pray that, we're often not looking to bring somebody in front of everybody and say, this is what they did wrong. Let's all work together to try to, you know, make it right and help this person understand that what they did was wrong. I don't think that that's the way that most people use this verse in their prayers. They're using it to say, God, you're among us because there's more than one Christian here. But we know now that because Jesus died, the Holy Spirit, when we put our faith in God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We always have God with us if we are believers. So when you're by yourself, you don't have to say, oh no, I just need another person so that God can be among me and help me, you know, make a good decision or do this or do that. God is with you. If you are a believer, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You don't have to have another person. But decision-making is wise and better when you can bring other Christians, solid Christians who understand the promptings of the Holy Spirit. They can give you wisdom in making decisions, right? They were making decisions about how to handle when their brothers sin against them. And so when you are facing difficult decisions, it's wise to gather together other believers and say, this is what I think God wants me to do. What do you think? And they can pray. They can ask the Holy Spirit to validate what you're feeling or what you feel prompted by the Holy Spirit to do. And so this doesn't mean that without God, or I mean, this doesn't mean this doesn't mean that without other Christians around you, that God isn't with you. It just means that you are able to get more discernment from God, from the Holy Spirit. You're able to wade past your emotions 
because other people are looking into the situation for you, especially when dealing with conflict, because that is the context of this verse. It's not about us gathering together for church and God being to, with us because we're gathered. The Holy Spirit is there because one of us is there. But it feels even better when we're all there worshiping God together. But this verse is about clarity in making difficult decisions. And so I hope that that helps you see a little bit more about this verse. This one is a lot more of a subtle difference. I think that a lot of us would overlook this when we were just reading through it on our own. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's taken out of context in the way that it is. It's not so obvious like Philippians 4.13 or Jeremiah 29.11, but that's why it's so crucial that as we read through scripture that we read it through this lens of them, God, and us. So I want to encourage you guys as you continue to um, read God's word this week to continue to use that method of reading scripture. So I hope that you guys will have a good week. We miss you a lot and I hope that this helped you understand this scripture a little bit more.